Hey, everybody. It is your good friend, the Safety Doc, from down here in the North Star Recording Studio, where it is a brisk 63 degrees today, and uh, we're setting up for a colder weekend here. So I just want to wish everybody a happy Friday. It is 9 o'clock central here in Wisconsin and uh, feeling good. So I have my 24-ounce coffee, which I have to maneuver under ouch, the mic arm. Right, usually they remove telephone wires when I do this, but yeah, right here, still still steaming. So I'm gonna leave that over here and let that chill a little bit. Um, but yeah, it is a sunny day. It's cold, so but that is <laughs> that's as far for the course, right? Um, today is face validity Friday. It is November nineteenth, two thousand twenty-one, and let's talk about face validity at the start. So what is face validity. If I have a thermometer, which would be a great prop, right? Probably not that hard to find either. But if I had a thermometer and I'm standing in the middle of a snowstorm, I'm shivering, and that thermometer is reporting 88 degrees, something is wrong, right? Either the thermometer is broken or I'm delusional, one of the two. So that's face validity. When what you're observing in your environment doesn't match what's happening right so so you know you're being told things on the media you're reading things in a report or whatever but you're like whoa you know <laughs> like whoever is doing the weather today said it'd be 88 and sunny and uh yeah i'm out here and it's snowing so that's not 88 and sunny so the whole thing of face validity but it it goes across all our areas of life right so face validity in what we're told by the news what other people tell us um, when we're in stores and we see prices right on things and we're like whoa like that seems pretty expensive versus what it was face validity of inflation so it's one of those things that um, also changes the whole they said to I observed and that's something I always try to demonstrate and expect that from people that I work with I expect that from my children. Um, okay, that's what they said, but what did you observe? And that becomes different then. You don't rely on the second, third, fourth hand information, which typically isn't accurate. Or it's the game of telephone where it gets passed on, pieces of it get lost. So we have five articles today. And um, but first, I want to send a shout out to SAST. SAST, one too many. Good morning, Sass. He says, good morning, Doc. Can only stay for a bit appointment soon. Okay. Well, thanks for stopping in. And um, one thing about Sass, and Sass um, is going to be a guest on the regular Monday Safety Doc podcast in the future. Um, Sass is the modern ball, cannonball run, 200 miles an hour, but safely. So uh, thank you, Sass. So we have uh, five articles today that we're going to go through and talk about some other face validity things. So the first one is an article from USA Today. It's Wisconsin health officials say hunters should wear a mask while handling deer carcasses. So it's hunting season here in the Northwoods, or at least it will be soon. So um, the second is from the star. The battle against airborne COVID has shifted. Why your mask is the last layer of defense. That is from The Star. Our third article, article is from Zero Hedge. Not one hedge or three hedge. This is Zero Hedge. Cargill, CEO, ditches team transitory, warns of persistent food inflation. Now, I took that exactly as it's written, but I think it's supposed to be term transitory. But, you know, um, I didn't change it because that's what it said in the in the article. So I don't know. I don't know if anybody had a, hey, we're team transitory versus the term transitory, but zero hedge. Uh, the fourth one is from NPR. Beware of shrinkflation, inflation's devious cousin. And five is from UPI. An owl flies into a school where the mascot is an owl. So those will be our five. I do have on... Uh, it, so it's colder down here in the North Star Recording Studios. So I have on um, one of my NFL thermal shirts. So this one is the the Jets just end the season, right? The Jets. And 
these this is a, a different one um they, i have typically these waffle weaves this is just a little bit fuzzy on the inside so it's not the one i would wear when it gets really really cold but um the thing is there's there's a company in minnesota i forget the <laughs> i forget the name right it's a great plug there but um they're on ebay and they resell donated items from um, professional sports teams and then also college teams and it's a nonprofit. so i've been able to score um, a lot of really good authentic nfl merchandise not that i'm a big nfl fan but the cold weather stuff that they give to the nfl teams is of extreme quality right because it's got to make it through football games um so usually stuff's in great shape and if it's not it can usually like just have it sew up and stuff like that nothing big because i'm not wearing this you know oh this is this is really survival wear here in wisconsin and they're also long so that's another thing um you don't have to you know worry about tucking them in or if you tuck them in and you know, don't have to worry about these things pulling out in in winter so it's the thing they just don't seem to make shirts sure as long as, as they used to even these insulated ones so this thing is like <laughs> this goes like halfway to my knees you know if you watch like the nfl games and players you know have their their jerseys you know out and stuff it's like those things are so long like the, the really big jerseys i don't have any of those but i saw a couple um and they have like velcro at the bottom like to put them together and stuff like that but uh so yeah um but that that's a cool so a cool way to get stuff that um is really good quality and really cheap <laughs> and it's easier to get stuff from the bad teams. So like right here with the, with the jets, um, it was pretty easy to find jet stuff. So, um, yeah, but anyway, just a little story here of, of the doc has his, uh, just, just end the season shirt on. All right. Um, so let's go with our first article here from USA today. Wisconsin health officials say hunters should wear a mask while handling a deer carcass. So, let me bring that up. There we go. Oh, oh, all right. No, I don't want to buy. No, no, I don't want to buy this. And okay, so I'm going to share screen. Yeah, share screen, share screen. Yes, got it. And got it and share. Good, there we go. And let's even do this. Okay. So, um, yeah, sharing screen. And here we go. So, again, this is an article uh, from USA Today. And let's see who it's by. Paul A. Smith from the Milwaukee Journal, November 16th, 2021. So, thanks, Paul. Um, Wisconsin health officials say hunters should wear a mask while handling deer carcasses. So let's look at this. Um, due to findings of SARS Cove 2 and white tailed deer, Wisconsin health officials have added a few planks to their recommendations to hunters this fall, including wearing a mask when field, when field dressing deer. Who writes that? Added a few planks? Interesting. Um, so it says uh, the State Department of Health Services released its updated guidance for deer hunters on Monday. Hunters are also are encouraged to use good hygiene practices when processing animals to reduce the risk of exposure to many possible disease agents. The agency says on its website, incorporating a few additional measures can help. So um, one of these is um, the, the list includes three new measures. One is wearing a mask while field dressing deer, um, limit cutting the deer's lungs, throat, and mouth. All right. And if you're immunocompromised, consider asking for assistance in processing a deer. So, all right, let's think about this from a face validity standpoint. It's one. It's a good from our good friend from the Tenderloin. I am in desperate need of a jolt of coffee here. So, all right, there we go. Okay, so. Um, questions right face validity um hunters should wear a mask while handling a deer carcass okay so this isn't anything we've seen before in the state although i want to 
um, bring up a few points on this. One is, so the deer, right, isn't breathing anymore <laughs> when you're processing the deer. So you don't have these aerosols coming out. So really it would be um, that, that you'd be touching a deer that would have the virus on it. But how would that then face validity wise be different than if you're touching a door handle at the post office or something on the shelf at a grocery store that someone else had just touched? Or so I, I don't quite, I don't get this, right? From a face validity standpoint, if you're wearing a mask while you're processing the deer, um, my grandfather processed deer all the time, go up to his house around this time of year in the garage, and deer would be hanging from the garage as he's processing. So, hey, it is our good friend Juan, and it is our also good friend, the bacon. So, skipping melatonin, stay awake. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Everywhere, I hope so. Um, so, Again, um, why do this? Why, say, wear a mask when you're processing? Because typically, a processing a deer doesn't create a lot of airborne and, and residue and things like that. As long as you're doing normal, typical things like right cleaning your knives when you're processing and stuff like that, you should be fine. So this is this brings up questions, and there's another part of this. In the year 2002 in Wisconsin, uh, deer, some deer were identified with having chronic wasting disease. So let me just talk a little bit about that. So it was, it's called Crutzfeldt jacob It's closely related to a form of mad cow disease, and uh, which had infected people, right? Primarily in Great Britain in the late 90s and 2000s, after they ate beef infected from these cows. So indeed, mad cow disease is known as a variant of this Kreutzfeldt jacob Anyway, both the disease attacks the brain. So people were eating cows that had Kreutzfeldt jacob this, this, um, and it would impact people's brains. Um, so, and it was mostly, mostly in people over age 60 <laughs> that this affected. Interesting, right? Um, so... While no human cases of chronic wasting disease have been reported to date, some of this Cruz felt Jacob chronic wasting disease in deer in Wisconsin and other states since 2002, they've identified it's still around today. While no human cases have been found, there are new studies that raise concerns that people who hunt or consume meat from infected animals could be at risk for CWD infection, which is a brain infection. So bringing that up and coming back here to our original article okay so as from face validity this this doesn't this ignores the chronic wasting disease which is still happening here in our state they have chronic wasting there's a test site 11 miles from me <laughs> and they had it on tv last night bring your deer here for testing for chronic wasting disease and the, and but they don't have testing for the sars uh COV2 virus there. Um, so basically, right, from a face validity standpoint, what's the guidance on handling deer that might have chronic wasting disease? Wouldn't it be you want to wear gloves or you want to wear a mask to prevent, as you're processing this deer, any airborne, right, aerosol stuff as that might have chronic wasting disease? So why is it, why is it this SARS- versus chronic wasting disease, when chronic wasting disease has been documented in the state for 20 years in deer. So phase validity brings up some questions. And again, um, you know, when you're processing a deer, hopefully it's not breathing, right? So you're not going to have this aerosol stuff. And and again, I, so to me, this, it's a weird, um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a weird statement to come out from the Department of Health of saying wear a mask when you are processing deer because of this um, SARS virus. And not also, why wouldn't you spin this as being SARS and chronic wasting, which has been here for 20 years, which we've had tons of TV commercials on and articles in the media. And again, th there are sites all over the state where you can take your deer to make sh sure it doesn't have chronic wasting disease. And if it does, I don't know, you should still eat it or process it. Because, But that's the thing, that, the, the worry, right, is if a deer has chronic wasting disease, 
um, that that's Crucifield Jacob we know in cows in Britain that transferred to some humans, mostly over age 60 and, and infected their brains. So again, this is one, it seems, why wasn't this in place or isn't it in place for Crutzfeld Jacob, but it's in place now for SARS virus in deer. So crying. Welcome to Armitage. Thank you, buddy. I see over here from DLD. So thank you so much. Um, Dean, morning, gentlemen, morning, Dean. So yeah, and it is a, um, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, Juan is ask Juan is the saying to bacon. Why up so early? So this is the, this is the one time I kind of, um, uh, get favorable terms because usually, um, it's always late when I'm participating in shows on the West coast. So like bacon's Friday night show, which I love, but it's 10 o'clock for me, um, in central time. So here, what I'm doing is show at nine o'clock. You guys got to get up at 719. So, but then you're probably going to be out on the, in the bay surfing anyway. And your day will warm up. Like it's, it's probably like 25 for I here today. So that's our first one. Our face validity with the whole deer hunting thing of this big campaign of, of wear a mask when you're processing because you don't want to get the virus from the deer. And by the way, like we're not also saying that that's <laughs> good for this Kreutzfeldt Jacob brain disease, which we've known has been around for 20 years. So, um, all right. I said, I'd be, I'd be a great PR guy, like bring me in on some of this stuff. Help. I mean, I'll, I'll have you come up with a much better story than this. Um, and it's so anyway, let's move on from that. Let's go over in the chat uh, again. Morning to Dean. Um, Dean, I like it. Laugh a lot. Fun to watch while I'm at work at the late streams. Put me asleep. Yeah. <laughs> so good, 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 good stuff. Um, so yeah, thank you. Wow. 10, th uh, 10 thumbs up already. I appreciate that. So thanks for the thumbs up. And um, right here, I am going to the um, paid version soon of StreamYard. Um, so we'll see what kind of magic that brings to the show. And I don't have any of my lighting going for like the recent shows because I thought it was just like <laughs> kind of leaving weird chat. I've, I need to set up my uh, tripods here in some different ways to, to try to get the lighting a little more uh, favorable. So let me go over here and go over here and here. All right, so that should help a little bit. But but yeah, kind of, I'll get it figured out. It'll go. Um, so hey, guys, before we before we move on to number two, which we'll get there in just a second, da -da -da. School of Air is the most honest book about the $3 billion school safety industry. And I was contacted by um, a security school security and expert an expert in florida who just retired this year and he said hey i i'm reading your book and i love it um it's a lot of the stuff i was seeing in schools like this is what we need to get into the hands of parents so they understand what's going on school boards things like that and so yeah that was that was appreciated so nice email yesterday from somebody in florida who i won't name it at this moment but um Thank you, though. Very much appreciate it. And appreciate all the work that that person has has uh, done in school and community safety. Our second article is from The Star. The battle against airborne COVID has shifted. Why your mask is the last layer of defense. So let's bring this up here from The Star. Da 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 out on Thunder Island. Here from the star. All right, the Toronto Star, nonetheless. So I think Hemingway wrote in the Toronto Star. Ah, the coffee is good. All right. So um, our good friends here at the Toronto Star. Um, the battle against air airborne COVID has shifted while your mask is the last layer of defense. Of course, defense with a C because it's Canada. Um, by Kenyon Wallace, who's an investigative reporter, then May Warren, who is a staff reporter. So this is Tuesday, November 16th, six minute read, but of course we're not gonna read the whole six minutes because they're trying to sell us dun, 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 some Summerland furniture, which we do not want. We are not going to accept. Um, 
So it says here, whether it's the moviegoer who ditches their mask at the start of a show to eat popcorn and never puts it on again, or the commuter on the subway who sports theirs just below their nose, um, mask use in Ontario seems to be slipping, literally. But with COVID-19 cases ticking up, and again, the cold weather, a reopen economy, and vaccinating rates plateauing, Canada's chief public health officer is urging people to double down on masking as a tool to help airborne transmission. So... Um, so anyway, um, here's the thing, right? So the battle against airborne shift at wire mask is the last layer of defense. As we go into this article, which it probably just has blocked me out of, right? So I think it has. Well, that's not very nice on a Black Friday. But anyway, um, this article goes on to make this argument. I'm saying we need to, to do the mask, but um, but it also doesn't, indicate <laughs> aerosol transmission, right? So there's an investigative reporter in this, plus a staff reporter. So what exactly is, from face validity looking at this, I would expect I'd get into this article and there would be, here's this type of mask, here's this type of mask, here's a coffee filter with a rubber band around it, here's a pair of Hanes underwear. Here's what aerosol looks like coming in and out. And you don't, that stuff's not in there, right? Um, because people haven't, done that type of assessment with different masks or even like how does temperature affect mask how does humidity affect mass and aerosol how does humidity affect how long aerosols stay in the air like again pr questions i'm out here hire me um you know it's <laughs> and these are these are all important questions right so but just to say that hey like people aren't you know, wearing the mask with fidelity, they're wearing them below the nose and stuff like that. Okay, like I get that, right? From a face validity standpoint, I see the same thing. So that part, we're, we're here, we're together. But um, but to then get on to the second point of this, of saying um, that, again, let's look at this, let's look at, I'm looking at the two paragraphs I still allow me to see. <laughs> I, after, yeah, why, that's the thing, like, right, you visit a site once and then they make you, you know, paywall back. So it's ex exclusive to subscribers. So, um, so again, but with COVID-19 cases ticking up again with the cold, cold weather, you know, cold weather to me would mean less humidity in the air, right? So that's a question from face validity. How does anything that's aerosol, whether it's a sneeze, a cough, puke, whatever it is, how long does it stay in the air if it is um, cold? And what does cold mean, like in Celsius and Fahrenheit and, and humidity, right? Because I would think it'd be less than if it's humid because the air, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong though on that, but I don't know. So it's a good point. Um, so um, yeah, uh, so again, COVID cases ticking up over the cold winter reopening economy, vaccination rates, but towing Canada's chief public health officers urging people to double down on masking as a tool to help prevent airborne transmission. So, um, and I saw some other articles similar to this. The point of this from a face validity standpoint is you can't just write an article like this. If you are an investigative reporter pairing with a staff reporter and not have some type of graph <laughs> or some type of visual that indicates this type of mask and then this level of aerosol transmission. And then the fact that every, just telling people to mask up, again, some people that's a bandana, right? So what, is, what does that mean, right? Um, it, it, it's a story that kind of makes this, this quick argument and then there isn't anything to support it. So again, from face validity, I'm looking at this saying, all right, it's a, it's a talking point. Um, your, <laughs> but as we get into this, I'm like, where's the beef? Um, yeah. So dun, 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 dun. sorry, Toronto star disheartening. Um, so let's go over here. Um, so bacon, uh, so right right here, uh, Bacon wrote to Juan, hey, my sleep schedule is messed up. I've been stuck at home waiting news of my engine. Engine quit on me. So yeah, right about that, Bacon. Um, so hope things work out <laughs> for you. 
I, I blew an engine on my 1996 Dodge Intrepid on the interstate. Um, it's because uh, I don't something something seized on it. I, I, I don't. It was a long time ago, right? <laughs> and oh god, that was horrible. That sucked. So man, I'm hoping uh, hoping things get taken care of here for you. So um, Bacon wrote. I was saying um, for all of this was going on. I'm trying to limit words so this gets recommended. Was going to have to be airborne for it to be effective. Therefore, therefore gave diapers wouldn't work. 18 months. And they're saying. So by now, and Bacon, you're bringing up points that make sense. By now, I'm just saying when you write articles like this, right, and you see it too as face validity, and you know Juan and everybody in here, we we see it from face validity though. And looking at this, it's like, hmm, like this is again, it's just not a, a headline article. This is from an investigative reporter. There should be some information in here about this whole how temperatures affect aerosol trend you know whatever's airborne stuff like that not there so um aerosols can't be stopped by mass droplets the mass are supposed to stop don't travel very far away aren't airborne so which is what you'd want to see in an article like this right some science on that or at least doing your own study like maybe you know at our studio we got four masks that we bought at stores around the Toronto area and we put them to the test. I mean, at least that's something. So, um, and then um, cold means outside environment is less hospitable to viruses, meaning indoor are more likely to transmit them than given human close contact. So, Bacon, you need to get a hold of our friends Kenyon and May up at the Toronto Star and. Um, have them add that in as another paragraph. See, these are things that face validity. This is what face validity is. It's these types of discussions. It's looking at things. But how many people would just take the headline on this and be like, whoa, you know, and jump with a headline? Or the headline again with, with the deer hunting and, and you know, wearing a, a mask and, and things like that. So, and, and the goal here on face validity um, Fridays isn't necessarily to... Um, always point out that something is wrong. Maybe something is going to be accurate, but in this case, not yet. <laughs> All right, our third article, or th well, I think I, our third article comes from Zero Hedge, and it is Cargill CEO ditches team transitory, which I think should be term transitory, but again, it's written, it's team transitory, warns of persistent food inflation. So we're going to put the phase validity test. Is this what we're seeing as we open up and check this article so here we go again this is from zero hedge and let me get it over here so and zero hedge zero hedge not just a partial hedge okay here we go zero hedge interesting um images <laughs> on the sides of this one but um so, yeah, they didn't correct it yet. It's still team transitory. This article is written by Tyler Durden on Wednesday, November 17th. All right, Tyler. Um, so, yeah. Um, let's see. Cargo CEO. So Cargo is a, is a big company and in food processing. So uh, David McLennan has changed his mind about transitory inflation and now believes it will be more persistent with higher food prices in 2022. He blamed elevated food prices on snarled supply chains, labor shortages, and adverse weather conditions, among other things. McLennan highlighted the labor shortages are a significant challenge for the food industry. He said processing plants across the country operate at less than full capacity, which drives down food output and prices higher as demand remains. So, um, in September, McLennan was on record saying soaring food costs could, no, would, sorry, would be temporary and should recede. Though in the last few months, world food prices hit a new decade high in October, supply chains was worse in labor shortages, and food processing plants, the transportation to ports expanded, adverse weather conditions had harvest, transportation energy costs skyrocket. It seems the food executive has ditched team transitory for a more logical understanding of today's inflationary environment. 
So, um, so yeah, let's let's look at this. So, this CEO of Cargo Food, um, you know, man, uh, processing company, one of the biggest, uh, is saying, "Hey, so food inflation um, is likely to stay here at least through 2022." And that's the thing too. Like if they're saying through 2022, they just probably mean just get used to it, <laughs> right? So um the the thing with this is this is from a face validity point it's also what i see right so see fewer things in the store um did some shopping a couple days ago and then i had to make an ancillary list over here of things that weren't in the store um not seeing as much for um you know also clothing and stuff like that's kind of been thinned down in store so anything i've ordered online is taking a while i have a pair of shoes I ordered literally from a place 40 minutes away from me. That's where the shoes were at, which I suppose I could have gone and got them. But, um, and I even talked to the dude on the phone and he's like, I'll put these in the thing tomorrow. And I'm like, well, what the hell? It's been a week and like they should have been here already. So now I've got to try to track those down. I've had a number of things, right, that just haven't been arriving. So um, I, my, um, you know, friends who are working in the food um, processing, I have, I have uh, two friends in, in that um, area have said, yeah, we're not at, we're not at full staff. And they're just says, like, people aren't applying for the jobs, right? You hire and then they, they don't show up or they're ghosting. And, um, and, you know, if truck drivers over the road drivers are being um, poached by, Amazon and, and other places, you know, right now. And I want to do a sidebar on that in just a second. So is this, what does face validity mean for this article? So the CEO is saying, hey, this term transitory, we're getting rid of it because it's likely costs are just going to keep going up. And the reasons he's giving supply chain, labor shortage, adverse weather. I don't know how much about the adverse weather. I'm not sure I'm buying the, that one. That's like the planes canceling you know, United or Southwest, you know, saying your spirit, hey, we're canceling because of, of the weather. And I'm like, I don't know. The map looks pretty clear across the U.S. <laughs> versus every other day, right? It's just a staff shortage or something like that. But um, I think that just broadens it out. So um, I wouldn't say we've had anything really different. I mean, it was a few years ago we had the derecho right in the in the Midwest and Iowa and stuff. So um, I think what the – so phase validity as I'm looking at this article – what it means is a few things. One is we are in crowd and behavior. We are not at a point when we are um, going to be out of chaos anytime soon. And he knows that this isn't going to end anytime. It doesn't know when it's going to end. Um, so the thought is if you send the message he sent out in September was this is probably temporary. Like food prices will bounce back and come down. This isn't saying that. It's saying just expect it to be high or higher so if you're sending that message the you're, you're messaging that that's what you believe so face validity is what we are seeing prices are going up there's no hint that they're going to go down and there's no hint they're going to go down in food so from a face validity standpoint this article matches that right and there's also some kind of probably positioning going on with this article of, of just trying to get people ready to accept <laughs> I guess not that they have a lot of choice on on some of these things, but just to say this is the this is the way it's going to be. And usually, if you tell people the way it's going to be, even if it's not good, um, they're less likely to get worked up about it. Um, so yeah, so the cargo article has pretty strong face validity. So over here in the chat, um, so Alex, hey Alex, um, continue printing money. Let's go, brand and winning. So. The level of money being printed, oh my God, it's crazy. And the fact that uh, interest rates haven't gone up to try to absorb <laughs> some of this money out of out of the economy is pretty is pretty nuts. Um, so, yeah, I I don't know. Um, so, I was in part of this too, um, over the road drivers. So at some point I'm going to do a show on this on my regular podcast. I was looking this up last night. I want to, I want to do a more comprehensive, um, show on that of saying like how many over the road truck drivers are there? 
what exactly were the um, the leniencies that were given during the pandemic for like hours driven and and how much weight could be in trucks stuff like that um, but you know over the road drivers during the pandemic when rest rest stops were shut down and and um, places to eat were shut down and all of that um, we we didn't do a good job at all of 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 supporting these essential workers, right? I mean, it was just crazy that um, National Guard wasn't out there making sure rest stops were open, that there were, you know, meal stations and things like this, because, I mean, that was a critical time, March, April, uh, May of 2020, um, to keep supplies going and and not, not only, you know, food and things like that, medical and, um, but, so you read all of these stories I was going through that yesterday, all of these accounts from over the road drivers who said, yeah, like <laughs> there were no bathrooms. Um, you know, the rest stops um, were, were closed, even places like we could put the, the rigs and things like that. And so that's a huge, that's a, just a huge failure. The messaging from like the government, right, to over the road truck drivers was very poor last year. So just want to say like that, just crazy. Um, so our, we went through our cargo article. Let's get into number four. Okay. Number four is from NPR or National Public Radio. Um, and let's bring up um, NPR. So dun, dun, dun. All right, NPR. And um, before we get there, let's go to, um, let's go to, Sast one too many says only the stock market goes up until it doesn't. So yeah, um, I noticed this morning uh, the market was down, but over the last <laughs> one month or two months, it's it's been pretty crazy how much it just continues to to go up. Um, nothing, nothing that's happening as a face validity, right? You'd expect the the withdrawal from Afghanistan to have you know sunk the market for. A month or so or more you know just things like like this uh like that doesn't happen um so this is beware of shrinkflation inflation's devious cousin and it's from npr by greg rosalski greg rosalski hey hey greg um so right here we've got all of our cereal and stuff like that and uh, he's saying hey a couple of weeks ago edgar dworsky our good friend ed dworsky walked in to stop and shop grocery store in Somerville, Massachusetts, like a detective entering a murder scene. Interesting way to start. He stepped into the cereal aisle where he hoped to find the smoking gun. Not sure. I, I like the way this is put together, but he scanned the shelves. Oh no, he thought he was too late. The store had already replaced old General Mills cereal boxes, such as Cheerios and Cocoa Puffs, going Cocoa for Cocoa Puffs, the newer ones. It was as though the suspect's fingerprints had been wiped clean. Then Dworsky had it toward the back of the store. Sure enough, old boxes of Cocoa Puffs and Apple Cinnamon Cheerios were stacked at the end of the aisles. He grabbed an old box of Cocoa Puffs, put it next to a new one, and aha, the tip he had received was right on the money. General Mills had downsized the contents of family-sized boxes from 19.3 ounces to 18.1 ounces. So, basically, um, face validity right here. Uh, is packaging getting smaller and uh, is it being badged as the same thing, family size and, and the same price? So I, I checked this out. Here we go. Dun, dun, dun. This is uh, one of my boxes, family size here of, of Kellogg's Special K. Yes. It's the cereal that I eat, uh, Special K. How, this thing is 18 ounces. Okay. One pound, two ounces, 18 ounces. So um, this box I had in the pantry and the new box is taller than this and skinnier and weighs less. Can I show you the new box? I can't because actually I, I <laughs> ate it and recycled the box, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But, um, but the new boxes are not as big as this box. So this one is, it was maybe like four months ago that I got. So this is the re reserve box. It's over in the the auxiliary pantry and sure enough everything's the same here on it you know the family size and all of it but they make the box taller and they make it thinner 
So there's a couple things from a face validity standpoint to pull out of that. Like it's pretty easy when you're packaging maybe meats and stuff like that where you can downsize. But if you're doing this box, like you have to retool your machinery, right? Everything has to be recalibrated to a smaller box. So you have to order a smaller box and redo the labeling, the you know, readjust the graphics and all of that so it matches. So there's something in that where you're not going to do that if you're, what the hell is this here, Kellogg's, right? All right, you're not going to do that if you're Kellogg's and you're like, this is going to last one to two months. Like, we're not going to, we're not going to do all these changes to our machines and, and, you know, with our stores that they're going to have to, you know, everything is then plotted out on, on stores, how much room there is because of the size of the box. So that's why they go taller and not, not wider and don't mess it up that way because they only get so much like frontal uh, space Then they can, you know, for facing, you can go back so many. And, but so there's some work involved in this from a face validity standpoint, when I see this and I am seeing this right now in items that I'm buying and I can compare previous ones to the new ones and it's smaller, to me that indicates they're expecting a long time in to chaos, right? They are expecting that, yeah, this is, this is a change. Things aren't gonna bounce back. We're not gonna have more suppliers. We're not gonna have more workers. And also like, People have just kind of become conditioned to paying more, just as that cargo thing. So if we can also charge this and people are going to pay it, then that's what we're going to do. And it's, it's not any big woo-woo because, I mean, what was it? You know, back when I was growing up in the 80s, you know, like a Big Mac at McDonald's would be like this, you know, not like, not like this right now. So it's kind of over time with everything, but definitely seeing it with uh, cereal and things that are packaged in like cardboard boxes and so and when you, again when you see that you have to realize right they're ordering now a completely different box size they had to redo the graphics so it fits on that box size and all of this stuff so like it's a whole retooling of the machine stuff which you're not going to do if you think oh this is just going to be around for a month or two so this whole shrinkflation thing um you, again, you'd quickly, you'd probably more see it in stuff like meat where you could easily, you know, just package it differently or, um, you're not, it, it again, takes a lot to do this. So let's go over here in, um, from the bacon. One would think that truck rest stops that are relatively isolated would be fine to keep open and readily sanitized for interstate travel. Of course, it makes too much sense. So I'm glad you, you wrote that. Let's talk about that as second so coffee I had a gift card for the gas station <laughs> where I got the coffee and I used it at 23 cents left on it today so after today's purchase so um so this is this is great face validity from bacon this goes back to the previous story but the with the face validity of saying, yeah, I mean, rest stops are typically, there's a lot of space around bathrooms and rest stops. And, and, um, you, it's, it would make sense, right. To, you could have national guard assigned to that, um, you know, with some additional potable water trucks, if you needed some additional hand sanitizing areas, you could, you could set up another area where it could be some meals, right? Which, you know, could be um, 200 feet away or something like that. I mean, so these, it, it makes, it, it makes sense um, to, to do that. I mean, and the fact that you, um, you didn't, right? You didn't get sanitizing supplies there. Somebody wasn't assigned to go through and to regularly, you know, uh, sanitize these areas, um, um, even distribute, right? You could have distributed um, hand sanitizers uh, there to the workers as as they're going and and doing you know their their jobs. Um, so it is it's really crazy that that wasn't a higher priority. I didn't write about it in the velocity of information because I mean you only have so many things you can write about. And to me though, looking back, I will talk about this when I 
talk about the velocity of information because I, I see it now uh, very clearly, right? Forensically of just, you know, here everybody's like, oh, if we, if we don't get these supplies in and they're making all these exemptions and, you know, so truckers are driving until they can barely stay awake. And then they're saying, by the way, like, we don't have a place to shower. We don't have a place to pee. We don't have a place to get food because like all this is shut down and it's like, oh, well, you know, why, why in the world weren't, you know, government decrees on this and state decrees and, and sending out and identifying and making this available um, to, um, dr you know, drivers saying, yeah, here are certain routes. I think they did that like uh, in Arizona or New Mexico. I read there were a few places that did it. It was done at a state level, but then it was just like a handful, like maybe like three rest stops where they like kind of went in and did something like this. But especially back in March, April, May, I mean, of 2020, it made perfect sense to do that. So again, it's a, this whole essential, non-essential stuff that I believe is going to impact people for decades. So anyway, shrinkflation, um, by the way, I'm going to put this box of Kellogg's, um, the real, the big box here, this thing's heavy, right? Hope not. But it's the big box, it's not the shrink box, $18 on eBay. So free shipping, um, just, but it's crazy. So again, face validity. Once you see this in your stores of things, um, of getting less, less quantity, right? In the same fee. And then also the same badging of da, 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 family size. That was the thing too. It said family size. Um, you have to think about like what went into doing that? Like there's, there's work into changing that up and you're not going to go through that work unless you are expecting you're going to stay with this um, for quite a while, if not just indefinitely. So, um, Baker note, Doc, I'm trying to behave for your morning. <laughs> you showed me a box of special K <laughs> isn't helping. So that's funny. Um, all right. So, yeah. So anyway, this this dude here who thinks he made this awesome discovery. So this is called shrinkflation, shrinkflation, where basically you're you're trying to pass off the same product and the same kind of badging on it, family size and stuff like that, but in smaller packaging. So a little bit of um, you know getting your marketing and artwork team to obscure the you know things. What is it like Disney? I remember we were at Disney World and then, you know, the, the scaling, right? So when you get up to buildings that they look like they're three, four stories tall, but really they're like two stories tall. It's just the way that they make the bricks um, bigger at the bottom and smaller toward the, the top. So it's the same type of thing is, is happening here. But yeah, shrinkflation is happening. Um, now, thankfully, well, I don't know, thankfully, but it doesn't happen on a gallon of gas. So it's not like you fill up and it's like... You, Instead of a gallon, you get seven eighths of a gallon. Just the prices is, is reflected there. But anytime they could, and I think we're going to see this in clothing. I am really um, thinking, right? I'm, I guess I'm concerned. Anything that I order, <laughs> I'm like, I, I think you're going to just, you know, less, less cotton in clothing, less grade of of quality. Um, we're shrinkflation is already hitting um, vehicles, right? They're deleting options out of vehicles. So, um, so guys, let's get over here to dun, 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 our number five. Okay. Our number five is all flies into um, elementary school where all is the mascot. All right. So let's get over here to our friend all. All right. All flies in elementary school or the L's mascot by Ben Hooper. Blocking that, Ben. Um, okay. So right right there is the owl. <laughs> flies in. And, and then the owl's like, hey, I'm also the mascot here. I'm not just visiting. I'm the mascot of the school. So November 17th, an owl paid a visit to a teacher's classroom at a Florida elementary school where the school's mascot is also an owl. Bonnie Warren, a second grade teacher at Central Park Elementary School in Plantation, said students already have been dis had been dismissed for the day when the owl flew into her classroom. Warren filmed video 
as the bird explored the room and landed on a book titled Nature's Show-Offs. It was unclear how the owl got into the building. So, all right, how the hell did that owl get into the building? Um, all right. <laughs> so anyway, face validity. This is just a fun article, so there's nothing really to this. Um, it's just a fun one to put in there. The owl flies, owl flies into the school, and the school's mascot is an owl. So this this will be the story forever in this school. So, yeah, um, I just it's kind of cool. Um, when I was a school administrator, we had uh, an elementary school where a snake got in, um, and there was a through one of the one of the doors that didn't seal up that went to the playground. So there was like a, th a three four a three or four foot pine snake. <laughs> It was a big thing. It was in the hallway. Everybody, doors are closed, and custodian just gathered up, took it back outside. So um, let's look over at the uh, at the chat here. And this is Sass. Sass just wrote, um, I've experienced shrinkflation since I was a teen. So, oh, no, Sass. Armitage. Or Armitage. So... Thanks, buddy. Um, I've noticed they do a lot of improper counts of number of servings, too. Oh, that's a good point. The packaging gets smaller, and they want you to cut it into more pieces. So that's right. So it's like, okay, like, yeah, how many? Let's look at how many servings are here in this box. 13 servings per container. So, like, how they would change this then is they would either, like, downsize it, and they would still say 13 servings. You just make your servings smaller. Like 13 servings, I don't know. It's, I guess, I don't know. I don't think I get two weeks out of one of these boxes, but um, but you're right. So the, the whole serving size thing can just be shuffled up of, uh, I like that, yeah. So that's the other part of shrinkage, just, just to pay attention to that. And I don't, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, so I, I see this, like, what should I do about it? I don't know if you can do too much right this is what something you're observing you can buy in, in bulk i mean if you're able to do that um what i've observed in bulk is that hasn't changed a lot you know meaning if you're buying um you know the five pound sack of beans or or rice and we have an amish dry goods store close to us um well, like 15 miles away and it's out in this amish community so <laughs> pretty cool. Like we have an Amish community um, next to us and they have this large grocery store. Oh, I mean, it's, it's not, I, let me rephrase it. It's large for an Amish dry, dry goods store. It's not like a Walmart or something like that, but um, it's modern and it has skylights, but it doesn't have regular electrical lights and no electrical register. It's all a cash. We've shopped there for years. And the whole deal is like bulk, right? So you get oatmeal, it's like a 10 pound bag of oatmeal and they they get things in and then they, they put it down into bulk packaging sacks and stuff like that. Um, so there, like I've noticed the, the prices and things and the amount that you're getting is still pretty standard. It hasn't changed much um, on, that, on that huge bulk. And there's not like a lot of overhead in that either um for what they're doing so yeah it is it is pretty cool um to have that close by so that's been a hedge because we'll go out there and again it's all cash so <laughs> so um it's it's pretty fascinating stuff um but yeah i would say just to be to be aware of this because the message is sending from face validity when you see the shrinkflation when you see that this will now be the museum box of family size special K because all the new boxes are smaller and they probably will be forever. That when you're retooling, when you're having to do stuff like that, um, that means they're anticipating, right? The sellers are anticipating that this is going to be this way for months, years, or forever. So you have to just start reprogramming your game because they're not going back to the thing it's not the scooter tuna which we had talked about lowering your tuna for 50 cents a can during this economic crisis to empathize just here it is um let's go to the the chat um 
And this one is uh, Armitage. Um, had dinner last night. Said it served for it. Barely fed me, and I'm not a big dude. So another, right, portions. Serving portions at restaurants. We don't eat out a lot. But something I've noticed is we just don't get as much when we eat out. And so I have a friend um, who has worked like the Friday night supper clubs. You know, Wisconsin, the supper clubs still kind of are here. The, they weren't totally snuffed out by the pandemic, but said, yeah, you know, now when they do like fries to go along with like fish fries and then, you know, French fries to go along with fish fries, they'll split up a batch of french fries otherwise i just gave this big mound of french fries and stuff like that so you're starting every, you know everybody's doing this you're just not you're not getting as much so but yeah that's a, that is a good point because i've noticed i've noticed that too like <laughs> i'm like holy smokes like this this would have filled me up and now it doesn't um so or else you get like the either the bowl of soup or the container of soup if you're eating out and then it looks like it looks like Hoover Dam right now with uh, Lake Mead behind it. Like Lake Mead is, you know, a quarter of the way down from the top. Like the soup isn't near the top anymore. Like you don't have to worry about the person spilling it on their way out because the thing's only like half full. Um, Sastro, serving size, three chips. Yep, I've seen. <laughs> so these are these are all great face validity things, these, these tricks. And again, when you start to see this, it's not short term to do these tricks that usually indicates um again when you're having to change packaging artwork and things like that um all pro lemonton by the way i love i love the biking i put my bike away for the year and it's it's always sad always sad because i love biking and um you know i'm just i'm not a winter bike -er, although like people people say like hey like you can buy these bikes in Wisconsin. They've got the big tires. And um, wait a second, did I miss? Um, sorry, did I miss DLD? Did I miss dark? Did I, or dark was dark. Hey, dark. Sorry, buddy. Um, I'll come back to all pro. Sorry, buddy. I didn't. I get on. It's the one man show here. I'm going between the three screens. I have an owl staring at me over here on this screen, so it's a little bit intimidating. But hey, buddy. Um, Welcome, 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 and have been uh, enjoying your show as always. So Dark had said to me, we're going to work uh, diligently to get you to 1,000 subscribers. And I said, you have no idea what you're in for because the world is against me. <laughs> you're taking on the world with this because, and no, the numbers are going up. Um, we are slowly, we are Sisyphus. We are like climbing up that mountain and just having like this rock try to push us back down. Um, so... And it's weird because like last week we had all of these views for the show. And now if you go back to the episode from last week, I think it, it literally lists like 300 views and 3,500 likes. <laughs> so, so yes, um, it is. Once I break through though, then it's like the true Rocky montage of training. Like I've made it, like I've got 2000 subscribers and I fought there with everybody in the chat and the supporters and it's all authentic. And uh, yeah, there was no easy way to the easy way to the top. So, um, but yeah, thank you. So we will keep fighting because it, it's going to happen. <laughs> as much as YouTube is working right now, they got like eight people on the job, and they're like, "Hey, like we're we're hiring. We're with Craigslist. Like we're hiring three full time people to suppress Dave's uh, subscribers and views. So it's all it's all you have to do. Um, great pay." 40 hours a week. So, um, so, all right. Um, five guys, all pro lemon. Then five guys is 20 bucks right now for a burger or drink and a fries. Nuts. Is it? It's crazy. Yeah. I was, um, we did Arby's a couple days ago and my youngest daughter like loves Arby's. And I thought like we lucked out. It was like a two for three roast beef day. But even that, it's like, <laughs> this is what I'm eating here. You know, it's like mostly bun. So, and yeah. Um, bacon to Armitage. Uh, Ma'am, this hungry man is barely an appetizer. Where's the rest of my food? Remember those those frozen dinners, the hungry mans? They used to really load up on those things. Um, yeah, there's not much. Uh, 
Ah. Um, there's not much to that anymore. I do a couple frozen, um, the hell is it healthy meals or something? Not because I'm really worried about them being healthy, but, um, once in a while, yeah, I'll just throw it in for lunch and I'm like, God, there's not much there. Uh, so there's not much there. Um, Sass wrote, Texas Roadhouse is still $11.99 for an ice burger and fries or baked potato. Cool. Good deal. Um, nice, nice, nice. Dark, good morning. All pro. Um, Armitage to, to bacon. Exactly. Don't be too hungry. You're going to need a couple of them. Um, bacon to Armitage. Dude, for real, the places in walking distance sell dishes that can barely feed me even when I'm burning as little calories as possible. Then again, I only eat once a day. So something I've done, and it's not because of uh, changes in food sizes and shrinkage of food products, stuff like that. But I really, I eat about twice a day. Um, yeah, so kind of like a 10, 11 o'clock-ish <laughs> meal and then basically supper. And if, I, if I'm hungry at night, a, a snack that I like, uh, planters uh, lightly salted peanuts because a jar of peanuts is like two bucks and you know it doesn't take much of a snack of peanuts to kind of fill to fill you up or just like regular popcorn i mean like regular so that's another thing at the amish dry goods store like you can buy like this massive sack of popcorn um and, and they again they package it right there so there's a little twist tie on the top and stuff like that um yeah, and that's super cheap. And I don't put butter on it. I put nothing on it. Just like regular popcorn. Of course, popcorn, you know, fills you up and stuff. I kind of like it. So, um, and um, all pro lemon tin. Uh, yeah, 19 bucks two days ago. So, yeah, I mean, you look at that. You've got to be making a pretty good wage to be paying for these things. Um Gas was, what was it, 388 this morning. Um, now, thankfully, like, I don't have to fill up often, but, like, 388. <laughs> I remember, right, gas back in in March and April of 2020 was under a buck in most of the country. But, yeah, three, 388. Um, Sass is like, I'm done with five guys. He's out of there. The thing was, five guys were going to sponsor Sast on his cannonball run. He's going to have like a logo on the side of his car. They're going to kind of do that graphic skinning of his car right there with the five guys logo. But now they're like, no, we're not going to do it. And uh, so um, Bacon wrote, I'm going to get blame for Doc and Arby's now. We got the meat. So <laughs> I, I liked Arby's. When I was in college, Arby's was five regular... Arby's burgers or barbecues, which they don't have on the menu anymore, which I thought were pretty good. Uh, five Arby's roast beef or for five bucks, five for five. So that was a big thing. And yeah, so now it's two for six. <laughs> but back then, though, the old five for five. Um, we had it when we moved here. There wasn't, there wasn't, no, I don't think there was an Arby's when we moved here. There, um, so we have an Arby's like this two years, been open two years in our town it's usually pretty busy um so i thought it was a win when we got an arby's and the burger king came back too like i haven't been to burger king but when we moved here we had a burger king and then it, it went out of business so um the perfect snack for the apocalypse if you sprinkle real bacon bits over it popcorn yeah so popcorn is as a bulk um to fill you up and then to add other things chew it right works pretty well um howdy is red crusader so howdy to um ohio and red so our good friend red in ohio oh oh, oh sorry here ohio um howdy to uh, ohio so um just a reminder here. So if you are watching the show to do a thumbs up, I appreciate that. If you are subscribed, thank you very much. Um, I think it was at 622 or 627 this morning, which is pretty cool. Uh, we're at 650 or 555 a week ago today. So up like 70 subscribers. So let's keep it going. 
hoping to get to a thousand subscribers by April 15th, which is the day that the book releases. So um, that is, that's my goal is to get to a thousand subscribers. And I also need watch hours. So um, I'll have to figure that out <laughs> a little bit more. I have to do some kind of non um, safety doc uh, shows to get the watch hours up there too. So it's, it's the 1000 subscribers plus watch hours, but um, thank you. And if you can share this with other people or say, Hey, like, you know, subscribe, and before we kind of get into our, our other stuff here, so dun, dun, dun. this is the book. All right, School of Airs. And this is also the thing where it's also the book, um, your local libraries, like wherever you live, if you email your library, like just take that two minutes, find the email address and say, I live here, this is my town. Like, and I want this book in the library. Like that works. Um, so I've, I, that's one thing, uh, people have told me, right. Is, is they'll say, Hey, like, you know, where are places I can get the books? You know, obviously there are libraries that have it, there's stores, things like that. But like, if, if it's not in your local library and you're in that community and you say, Hey, I'm in the community. This is a book I want you to consider for library. A lot of times libraries will get, the, get the book. It's just you have to like be in the community. Like I can't, I can't say like, hey, like you should get this book for the Inglewood Library. They're like, do you live here? I'll be like, um, no. So, not that there's anything I wouldn't, right? But I'm like, no, I don't live there. So then they're like, well, then we're not gonna get the book. Like you're just somebody calling from outside. So, um, but I actually do contact um, some libraries and just indicate right who I am and. And here's the book, it's school safety and, and things like that. And asking if they would consider it for their library. Then it's just me contacting them. But if, if you contact them, um, that's always a cool, that's always helpful. So um, Armitage will be at a thousand way before April. I'm sure of it. Well, thanks buddy. <laughs> and I'll tell you, um, and I greatly appreciate everybody who has subscribed and who's gotten out the word, who comes in and contributes to the chat and has followed. I had, I had such terrific feedback from Monday's show. It was about the teacher shortage crisis, right? And the mental health day thing of like the whole show was breaking down. So, you know, man, just saying you have a mental health day, day off doesn't do you much good, right? <laughs> it's just, how does it, how does that reset your mental health? And then usually you come back, you just have more work that you have to do in less time. And I had I had many emails on that, and they were all positive. People were saying this was really a you know well done blog post and really got a lot out of this show. And I'm like, well, thanks. Like that was that was really good. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the the difference of um, you know the Monday night show is the one that'll do the blog post, and then of course Face Validity Fridays is we're just taking some of these headlines, some of the things that we're seeing, and and just applying that whole Face Validity face validity filter face validity is always so as a research term i didn't know about this till i was doing my doctoral program so it's one of those things right i, I wish i would have had somebody would have told me this when i was younger um and i don't know like nobody ever did i i think we all sense face validity right it's like some this just doesn't see seem right versus like what i'm observing or sensing or whatever like hmm, i'm not sure this doesn't <laughs> what the official narrative on this and all that doesn't seem to match uh what i'm actually seeing and experiencing um and but we just we never know what is face validity and we don't teach people face validity right of saying does this really make sense you know right so um yeah face validity is like hey you know you come to this we'll give you a free meal and you know some amazon gift card and all of that and all you gotta do is listen to a three-hour presentation about this timeshare in ohio and i'd be like ohio that's an awesome place like yeah sign me up so but no right seriously um but yeah so um but right so you'd be like this this seems from a face validity standpoint, like, why are you going to give me a free meal? Especially with the way food prices are, right? And um, why are you going to give me an Amazon gift card? Like, it's just not going to be that easy as me enduring 
a three minute. Here's Boca Raton. And here's the Inglewood version. You can either stay there or Inglewood, either one, Florida or Inglewood. Same price, same layout. Um, you can stay one or the other. And like, you know, after two, three hours, you're going to be gone, right? No, like the, they're going to try to keep you there. They get your information. They keep calling you. This new, I mean, all these things, right? So, so from a feasibility standpoint, right? This doesn't, these things don't make sense. Again, the whole, the cereal box and the stuff. I'm going to be, I'm going to pay attention this summer when we we do our family vacations because um from face validity we already see shrinkflation from we saw this last year like um uh housekeeping right like they don't nobody makes the beds changes out the linen does anything like it's all upon that's that's your job you can go down to the front desk and say hey like we need some more washcloths or something like that and but no it's not the thing where you're gone and the room's all made up but i also think um when we go up to superior duluth the duluth harbor we take this this boat tour this harbor trip and i'm gonna be curious if they trim that down um you know if there's a truncate the trip it's just not as long so those will be kind of things that i'm going to be watching watching for on my way up there so or when we're up there, like just on our vacation experience, like what is, what are the things like the go-kart track <laughs> instead of four times around now it's five times around, or maybe you have to pay twice as much, but then instead of eight times, it'll be six times around. I don't know. I mean, just all these, these little things, like once you start to look for it, then it just, it starts to, you, you see it everywhere, right? If you're looking for it, you see it. And, and then the absence of it also would start to indicate, oh, like maybe, you know, people are moving away from chaos and or maybe there is um, there's an oversupply suddenly of these experiences or, you know, they're trying to, you know, fill up the boats and stuff like that. So they're going to give better deals or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I have um, I've worked I've worked pretty diligently to, you know, uh, get the book up to or get the book known right so then we talk about the book um to get the channel known and again it, it it has a crawl right now to to go forward so i've been doing this four years and i have 158 episodes of the safety doc podcast uh, which which a lot of interviews on there too so a lot of, of really interesting um people and interviews and then an audio that's all that's always on Podbean too. So like, you know, you can the Podbean gets quite a bit of downloads. And I switched to Podbean like halfway through. I was with SoundCloud. After I thought SoundCloud was going bankrupt. <laughs> and I should have just left it on SoundCloud, where, you know, like Aaron Clary and TJ Martinell have their stuff. Like that SoundCloud worked out fine. Um, Podbean hasn't been a negative, but um, but once I migrate it, right, I lost all of those views on SoundCloud. So the audio version does pretty well. And that I, I also think it's easier in some countries. If you look like where it's downloaded, some countries that don't have necessarily access to YouTube or, or the video stuff as easily, it gets downloaded. So, um, but like even there, I'm like, hey, like <laughs> there's a YouTube version and get over there and tell your friends and subscribe. So, um, but yeah, so what I am doing um, today, actually, so a couple updates here from the North Star Recording Studio is uh, my oldest daughter is upgrading her phone today. So that is some big news. Um, yeah, she's going from a Samsung to an iPhone. And so, yeah, we'll see how how that goes. But she's apparently she's made the case for it and she's had the Samsung for quite a while. Um, so which we will be recycling within the family, um, that phone. So just be getting rid of the oldest phone we have, which is probably like six, seven years old. Um, so that is happening. I am debating. I'm on the fence of taking my S nine, my galaxy S nine and upgrading to an S 21. So I don't know. Um, the reason one of the reasons to do that would be that the camera is better and remember the days like it wasn't that long ago 
five years ago, you had a digital camera, right? So um, we, you know, that, that was the big thing. Um, your phone camera wasn't high enough quality to, you know, take good photos. So we have all of these digital camera, uh, you know, like three different digital cameras, probably from the year 2000 all the way, maybe last one we bought, 2012, 2014. And they were pretty good. Like when our kids are growing up, most of the pictures are taken on those. So, you know, they're pretty good. I wish they would have been a little bit better, but they're pretty good quality. And um, what I, but now, like, you just don't have that. Like, why would you, I mean, we're not, to me, like I'm not taking professional art type photographs. Just use my phone, right? And so you don't have to bring, it, I was in this big pouch on the, my belt. <laughs> it looked like my belt was digesting a rabbit or something. Um, and that's where my camera would be. So, um, yeah, it was just, it's just crazy, but I still, the cameras still work and I have the chargers and everything and the, the video is pretty good on those. So I think I'm going to use those to get some video when I'm out biking or if I do, um, I want to do a couple shows in summer, like when I get biking again. And if I do not necessarily like rig it up. I'd have to do like a GoPro or something when I'm biking, but to have a stationary second camera, that would really work well just for like, not necessarily audio, but just for some video. And if anything happens to it, no big deal. Cause like those things are obsolete and we're not using it for anything anyway. But, um, but yeah, my, my, yeah. So my Motorola is in good shape. I noticed the battery is, you know, just not like it was and there's not much you can do it this point with it but i'm like the camera though you know for the the having a better camera would be a plus and the battery life is better plus the um it has gorilla glass i've never wiped out a screen on one and the s9 has a curved screen at the ends um and that never caught on so it's <laughs> So like they got rid of that, so I wouldn't miss that at all. And I always use an otter box, um, protective otter box covering on it. But I'm pretty, I think if they have them in stock um, and they can do the transfer, I actually burned all the pictures I took off the phone, I burned onto uh, CDs and then uh, burned, I also burned them over to an external hard drive and an internal hard drive. So I have like three places, the CDs are stored one place, external hard drive, and I don't keep any pictures in the cloud. Um, and I've never wanted to to have let people have access to like pictures of my family and things like that in the cloud. Like I just don't feel like that's secure. Um, so I always, you know, just like if it was traditional pictures, like a digital picture or the old, um, you know, 35 millimeter camera, which I used to have, like, right? Just always keep that. So um, let's go over here to... Um, bacon question you host your own content like i do why not just consolidate everything there so tell me what you exactly mean by that why not host your consolidate everything there so all right i don't i don't quite help me out with that big um motorola had some decent stuff for the price that's what i got i like motorola so i'm gonna check um I'm more, you know, and I'm Android, so that's good. I'm not, <laughs> I don't know the Apple stuff. I have no desire to know the Apple stuff. Um, so, you know, like I said, my S9 is good. Um, the reality is that I, th I think the batteries, oh, well, I know the battery's going. So um, I've had, yeah, probably I've had the phone three years. Um, and again, it also serves as our, family camera and stuff like that so um but that one mine would kind of get just get recycled internally too here all pro i wish there was an alternative to google and apple i agree like yeah totally um i shared last it was the last week this time i was having big issues with my google drive and i don't put a lot of stuff on drive um it's usually university stuff when i teach um, and when it's, it's that, it's, I mean, nothing confidential, but it's like articles, you know, that I'll use stuff like that. Um, 
so when I'm at the university, if I because they don't accept thumb drives anymore in their system, like it all has to be virtual. It has to be all on either OneDrive, Third Drive, or like you can log in and access. Well, I don't, I don't want to put all my stuff on Third Drive because what if I don't work there anymore? Like what if then you know then I have to deal with that. So I'll just keep it on my Google Drive. Like I'll be fine. And then um, all of the the book stuff was on Google Drive, and then I made backups of it on my internal hard drive and external. But there I, I went a little overboard on some of the stuff in Google Docs. So I had to spend a lot of time saving Google Docs down as Word. But I'm like, what if you get shut off from this stuff? Like it happened in 29 countries last year. Or, it, it, you know, it, I, I'm just like, I don't, I don't want to be in a situation where I can't access my stuff right and the reason to do the book in google google docs and google in general was to have files i can share things out like with the people i interview here's the chapter that's about you here's the um, images that you sent with the permissions you know and i can send stuff back to the editors and stuff it's real smooth like that way um and they can put little comments and i can put comments so super super smooth worked really well um, but then, yeah, now, um, like I said, the system's just been giving me some hiccups and I talked to a friend of mine who is, um, an IT, um, head of an IT for a uh, company. And, and I said, Hey, like, is this like, am I the only one this is happening to? He's like, no, like, this is pretty well known. And, and here's what you should do to minimize that. And so I've been working to get stuff off a of Google Drive. And that's, I, I guess that's my, I don't know if I'd recommend it to everybody else, but I I think storing stuff cloud-based is just asking for trouble <laughs> down, down the road unless like um, just your access to it, right? Or um, I, I, I just, you know, we, we all have free Gmail. Well, how is that really paid for, right? it's paid for because in the agreements then you know, your the, your gmail can be scanned and all of this stuff and they use it for marketing and whatever and and i know google drive but google drive is like what 20 bucks a year so um i'm just it's yeah anyway you're right i wish i so my friend who's the tech guy is like everything i have i just have internally like i, I built a second computer that um, it mirrors to. So I, wherever I can, I can log in remotely to like my home computer and my second computer. So it's kind of like a Google drive. I'm like, well, Christ, I don't know how to do any of that. He's like, yeah. So, but yeah, it's like Google drive is fine. If you just kind of do it for those types of things and have backups and yeah. And, but yeah, um, my phones always break. This is one. I need a phone that's fast and durable. So one, if you, if you've used the um, otter boxes so they have the um, different ones i use the commuter which isn't as thick and then there's like another one the otter boxes have always served me well so you know just saying i've i've had good luck with those um the armor ones are usually not armored from my experience so and i think you probably go are much more rugged with those things i usually don't take them into any scenarios where they're going to get beat up a lot. So um, I'm using a Motorola right now. It's bacon. Um, I'm using a Motorola right now. Bought it new at the store. Satisfied so far. But crap results before. Third time's a charm. So um, I mean, having your content under your control, not just under a third-party service like SoundCloud. Yeah. So um, it's a good point. I, so I don't get a ton of downloads and I have, I have all of the files, right? If I actually had to produce my own server, I guess, for my audio, I could do that. Um, but right now I don't, I don't feel like I have any, I'm really compelled to do that. But you're right, I, I could, like the possibility would be there. Um, so, and I think, you know, Podbean gets it out there for some Google searches and stuff like that. And one of the things is I'm learning more and more is just like more of my content needs to show up in Google searches. So when I'm writing blog posts and things like that, that's important to do, especially with the book coming out. Um, 
Armitage, phase one, Skynet poses as Google to gather info on us before John Connor war. So God, yeah. I remember when Skynet took over. Um, yeah. So yeah, the amount of information, right? It's just, it's crazy. Like how I talked to, um, I talked to a professor who studies this in my state and has for years, like how much information is gathered on people and then just how much information people put out there on the web on their own. That's not protected. Um, you know, like, Hey, like I ate at this place or Hey, like I did this. And like, if you follow just the publicly posted stuff for a couple of weeks, you can get a pretty good idea of what their life is, like who their friends are, their family, their pets, where they live, what they do, just from what they posted, like what they've shared. And he confronted, um, somebody, I think it was a college student. And it, this was like 10 years ago, right? Had said, here's, here's like information that I've gathered about you. And I think that was like a really awkward, it's a really weird thing too. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> but it was part of like the study of, there was a group of, of people and they, I don't know, identified at random. And, and it was just, what can we publicly find just through public searches, right? That people are putting out there. And then like he was saying this and this, and she's like, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And I think, I think it got to the point where they were like threatening to sue him. <laughs> and, they're, and he's like, wait, I'm just trying to get this point across of, you know, protect your information, right? Because you're putting a lot out there and then, you know, not revealing this person's name, but just using it as a case study saying here was somebody and here's their age. And um, here's what we were able to learn about, about them just from what they were posting. Um, but yeah, it was pretty crazy. I think it's, it's not quite like that today uh, because the, the settings are different. Like you can't see as much, but back in the days when stuff was wide open, but then again, people are posting more <laughs> today too. So the be, I don't have any desire to do it, but I bet if, if you sat down and did a search on somebody and then were subscribed to some of their social media that was public and kind of watched it for a month, you could probably figure out a pretty good profile of that person. Like enough where you could sit down with them and share some stuff. And they'd be like, what, <laughs> how do you know that? Well, because you've been posting it out for the world to see. Um, Bacon Roads Armitage. Honestly, I trust Skynet over what we have now. At least they're uh, fairly honest. So yeah, Skynet, I don't know. It's um, so I have an article, interesting note, Armitage. There's a company called Skynet that makes parts for military drones and a company named Cyberdyne Systems that makes programs for those drones. Yikes. Oh no. That's, um, that's scary. Um, okay. So I had an article, I had, um, an issue of the UW-Madison magazine came in because I'm an alumni and usually I just throw those things away. But um, I did page through this one and it had this uh, whole section where UW is working on robot companions. Interesting. And I'm going to use that and make that into a podcast too. But the they were predicting, right, their robotics team and stuff like this is within 20 years, you would be able to buy a um, companion robot, right? So, I mean, right now, what? It's got like your Amazon Alexa or something like that. And there are these, I saw a couple, they're expensive though. So a couple thousand dollars and then like a high monthly subscriber fee, like for kids, like these, these robots kind of, that they're, they're friends of the kids and give feedback and hey, like, hey, we have a challenge here. We're going to draw a picture or something like that. It's pretty, pretty much in its infancy, but, um, but anyway, they're saying in 20 years, you'll be able to get a subscribe and get a robot companion. Right. And I would say probably, right. I mean, these things will be marketed. I mean, I think it'll be much further down the road before we're going to see anything like, um, I robot, but it's like, I mean, yeah, it's, it will happen and not that these things are necessarily going to have this whole ai capability and all of this but that they would at least um you know be there in a house I'd, so let's put <laughs> sastro i put 
uh knock em stiff ohio is my birthplace on social media so right i used to put horse piss river pennsylvania um but Armitage wrote, if they had robot companions in the houses, there would be someone to monitor, make sure we'd be inside lockdowns, maybe even keep us inside if we want it to go out. So the so let's think about this. The messaging on robot companions is I don't think they would be that expensive either, because if they were allowed to gather information and maybe like they give out um, recommendations on purchases, right? <laughs> and marketing and things like that. Um, oh, you need this or whatever. So I'll just, you know, authorize me to place an order and then the drone delivers whatever product. Um, and de definitely for remote people or elderly, right? That this is there it's to pair up with a wristband that they wear for blood pressure monitor, um, uh, diabetes, heartbeat, everything like that. So it is, it's pretty crazy. Um, and right. So it's pretty, the article was compelling, right? Who knows how this will actually play out, what this would look like, but it's not that far down where these early versions of a companion, which will clearly be a robot. It's not going to be human like, um, but it is probably, yeah, I mean, we'd, you'd be able to buy that. And again, it will be badged as, you know, if you have kids, you know, so it can monitor the house or something. Is Not that it's going to replace an adult, but um, if you have, you know, if you're elderly, like that's going to be a big, a big thing, right? That heart rate, blood pressure, things like that. Um, so the Bacon wrote, uh, no, Dave, you, you have used your lot of time outdoors for shopping. I cannot let you do that. Yeah, well, that was an iRobot. Remember that? person was trying to get out, and they're like, you must stay inside. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it is. So, but um, imagine, so as we think of this, again, you know, I don't think cost is going to be a barrier on this because it's, it, it's a massive uh, marketing tool. For, and, it, and also for government, a propaganda tool that, you know, the, what these things are sharing or it's like, you know, I, here's your, here's your news updates for the day and who's buying, f you know, for those or, you know, the monitoring of what you're doing. And um, so, so I actually think these things will be very affordable and very ubiquitous for the fact of what they'll gather for information and, and that they'll try to, it's the highest bidder is going, <laughs> it's your General Mills versus your Kellogg's cereal or stuff like that. It's just really, it's kind of weird. Um, yeah, like every, they'll help you compile emails and they'll read emails to you or read voicemails, stuff like that. Internet of Things is the new home robot. Yep, yeah. We are, we are not there yet, but we have a car. So we ordered a vehicle in March and we were informed um yesterday that it is almost here <laughs> so it took a long time to build right because of the parts and stuff like that so i'm just crossing my fingers things will be okay i think we're okay but um but yeah so come the vehicle it, it's replacing you know is in a time before backup cameras and any sensors and you know now it, this vehicle will have teen driver and all of those features so you know, you can bring up and every place the vehicle has been. You can have a map of and where it's been, how long it's been there. Um, and of course, everybody knows that. And your insurance company wants to know that to get, you know, rate discount and stuff like that. But so I'm like, you know, there's this, this is pretty, it's pretty weird. Like it's, it's pretty weird to go through that. So, um, Armitage, uh, then they lock the, the smart house, uh, door on the smart house door clicks. So yeah, um, man, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it, who knows? It could be this, this kind of weird 
a robot dystopian future? I mean, who prevents these any, any of this stuff getting hacked? Or or you, who? When are we going to see like um, the first real publicized hack of a you know Amazon Alexa come into play <laughs> or something like that? Um, or you know these self driving cars, right? Like so, when I was writing about that in in the velocity of information. One of the issues with self-driving, well, there's issues with self-driving cars, right? But an issue was, what if it gets hacked, right? What if that or a network of cars gets hacked? Um, and then what do you do? So it's like, um, who's responsible? Uh, <laughs> Sast, I'm sorry, Dave, but I'm afraid I can't do that. So, ouch. I'm not looking to get a robot up in my area anytime soon, but... Um, and I, I, you know, I, I, and I think, I mean, Sass, how long will it be before homes are built with kind of almost this, this robot thought in mind? And I say that because I have a friend in Canada who's building a house right now um, and is about halfway through it. They're starting to drywall and stuff like that. But when they built the house, they, they built it. So there was a electric car charging port in the garage even though they don't have an electric car, like they had it wired up for what, 220. And, and um, so because like the builders said, well, <laughs> we either do it now or down the road because it looks like it's going to be mandated, you know? So they're just like, okay, you know, let's design it. And here's what makes sense where to put it and stuff like that. So um, I just, I just think that stuff is, so then what does it look like too for like robots and, accessibility or like interwired houses and I don't know. We almost have some of that already with these these ring cameras, right? Like people can agree to have their ring cameras as part of a local network. They do that around me, like not in my city, but a couple cities away. The people can just make their ring camera available to police and then the police use it as part of surveillance. So then they suddenly you have 300 ring cameras which are surveilling neighborhoods and people you know so you got to think through that stuff right like okay um so let's check here um armitage on that side note i wouldn't mind a robot to carry my stuff for me i think i mean right at some point robots are going to be mowing our lawns are going to be preparing food cleaning homes i mean there will be a, a lot of things that will be done through robotics um so, you know, take the good with the bad, right? I think I think there are some things that are going to be pretty incredible um, that are going to come out of this. Um, Alex wrote, um, "Sexy times robot will not <laughs> nag, will um, not cook, but it's okay. Always available in any position." So, Alex, so yeah, the the whole thing of um, yeah the the robot companion industry. And like Japan, so a friend in Japan who said, that's really, you know, they're really making that overt now and advertisements over there. And, um, you know, what is, what is that going, what is it going to look like when someone says like, I want to marry my robot companion or could you, leave an estate to a robot companion. Like these are all things in 20 years. We'll see, like this will be on the news. <laughs> um, so, you know, what is, what is that? By the way, I got my hair cut on Monday and, and it has already grown out a lot. Like this was thinned down a lot. My hair grows super fast. So I was like combing it this morning. I'm like, my God, which I'm not complaining at all. But um, it's, yeah, I'm like, I just got it done uh, money. Nest of all exclusive use only. Alex, thanks, but best of all exclusive use only. You tell me the self-driving car to take you to the gun store. It says, no, guns are bad. Now I'm walking. So, um, Armitage, so this is, right? These are all things... Um, that will ha have to reconcile because what if it, right, it could say that. Or what if you say, um, 
take me to whatever and who knows what stores will be around in person but let's say let's take take me to walgreens and like this person has a debt at walgreens right they they owe money so like they get there there's some communication back and forth in the vehicles like we'll not take you to walgreens like walgreens has banned you from the site or um there's also this thing of saying like if somebody were to shoplift something from somewhere and then try to leave in a vehicle and like you activate it that they shoplifted that then the vehicle wouldn't go or something now i think there'd be a have to be a lot to go with that but um would that deter shoplifting personally i don't think so <laughs> but, but yeah so you, you know or the other thing right is armitage you're talking the vehicle is going to record every place you've been. We talk about $600 transactions, Janet Yellen, you know, once your financial tra transactions recorded every $600. Well, think about this, right? Like everywhere you go, either in a self-driving vehicle, or if there's some degree of saying, you know, all vehicles need to be connected to the internet of things for whatever reasons, right? So it's always like pinged, you know, kind of like the vehicles, you know, that have on star and stuff like that. It's always, you know, always pinged. And it's like, so there'll always be this record of where you've gone. And then there could be the social credit score that someone is deciding what goes into that. And it's like, oh, you seem to go to the gun range a lot, or you, you know, seem to go to flea markets a lot. And I mean, who knows, but these, these are going to be, these are por uh, portfolios we have no way to shape i mean our behavior shapes them but our behavior isn't criminal right but other people are subjectively going to look at this or have algorithms and say hey it looks it looks like your profile is one that you know we need to limit access or we need to have some people come talk to you so it's like whoa um that quote was from space odyssey the hell 2000 i remember that i remember watching space odyssey bacon to alex you know damn well guys these days uh, well, kind of a way to get worded by the robot wives. Um, oh, <laughs> we are in for some crazy, some crazy times in the future. Technically a robot mows my lawn. I rig the mower up to be remote controlled. That's, uh, wow. I, I saw, um, I saw one of these remote control, not remote, but one of the a mower, it looks like kind of a Roomba. And then, yeah, it, somebody in our neighborhood has one. Now, the question I had with that was like, I mean, what's the liability on that thing if it, if, yeah, um, it does, if somebody gets hurt with something like that, like that's the thing, right? Um, and yeah, but um, I hate it. Oh, the dogs. Uh, Wiz Division Productions. Hey, Wiz Division. If you haven't subscribed over here to the show, please do so. We are up to 19 likes for the show, so I appreciate that a whole lot. We are fighting against the machine here because um, 627 subscribers to the Safety Doc Podcast, which is awesome. We are at 555 one week ago today. We are going to get to 1,000. <laughs> and even though like last week's show, originally when it was done, I don't know, it had like three, 4,000 views because I had it like took pictures of it and all of that. And now I think it's registered at like 294 views, but yet, yet like 3.4 thousand likes. So the algorithms and are working against me, but eventually I'm still going to win out. Um, Naughty time robot malfunctions and death grip on your salami. Ouch. So um, that this is, that would be an interesting um, show to have somebody on with, with robotics and kind of talking about things like that because um what is oh my god like it's crazy um what would robot companies do to already cratering birth rate yeah that's been a i've heard that question um once robot um companions become more into play are you going to have uh, male female um, bonding marriage what are families going to look like what defines that so um i don't i don't i mean because we always when i was growing up right and it was always kind of the jetsons thought of the future would be 
robots that would be there to augment the family. And now the thought is robots would be there to be the companion. And it's like, whoa, um, RFID and everything soon, SAS one too many wrote. So RFID tags are radio frequency identification tags. Yeah. And I, th it's weird because, um, so SAS, I had, I, in, in the last year I had, um, a shirt, a pair of shoes and, uh, uh two solar lights <laughs> that I all ordered online and they, they had RFID tags. Okay. So they were tracking where they were going and, um, they lost the logistics, lost them. Like they couldn't tell where they were anymore. Like they couldn't even tell like where they were last tracked, which was really weird because I said, doesn't, isn't there an RFID tag? So anyway, um, yeah. So lo logistics kind of got, um, messed up on that, but so, um, yeah. And the thing is like, especially as phones become more ubiquitous and just, ve you know, ve people, once you get a certain number of points of data on somebody, like somebody knows your vehicle and your phone use and where the phone is at different times, like you can pretty much map out <laughs> where someone's at during their day and stuff like that. So it's pretty creepy. Um, but yeah, if not already. Uh, auto YouTuber, why are you taking me to the local police station? I said the local strip joint. So could a vehicle, could a vehicle um, take you to law enforcement or could a vehicle, yeah, um, because you, that, that, that was one scenario I read of what if you go into a store and you took something and you didn't pay for it, then you got out and because of RFID tag and all that, uh, which SAS is talking about, the store identifies it and then it sends out something. And then the vehicle says, uh, returning to store and you need to take this item back in. And if you didn't, like, would it just shut off? And then like the, the police would show up or would the vehicle just be disabled? Or like, there's going to be these weird ways to um, influence behavior by access to your vehicle and your vehicle driving rights. I mean, that's one of those things too, of like, you know, if the speed limit's 65 and you're going 75, <laughs> I mean, there's going to be something built into these vehicles where they're going to give you a certain amount of time to get your speed back down or else they'll just like bring it down automatically to that. But what if like there's a, bad read on something or what if like you're trying to get away from some situation right like how is all that encountered so um sassed one too many cash for clunkers helped sped up the adoption of vehicle tracking billions where the good cars are li literally scrapped yeah at the time uh just what garbage like seeing vehicles that were well built, a lot of well built vehicles. Um, that if you would have invested some money into, yeah, <laughs> updating the engines and just updating the vehicles, that they, they would have been probably fine getting scrapped. And now, now you look and it's like, oh my God, you know, this shortage of vehicles and just, yeah, that was just such a sad thing. I remember going past a dealership where they had a dumpster out front and then they had a vehicle in a dumpster and that was their whole cash for clunkers like signage thing and just face validity at the time remember like we went through that all you know class sass guys and i remember face validity at the time i'm thinking this is just really a bad thing right because you i guess a vehicle completely isn't you know functioning and stuff like that yeah i mean but there were a number of vehicles that were still functional vehicles um and that were just taken out uh just to right get people to buy after gm went bankrupt and stuff like that and 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 then but you know now where are we you know we've lost a number of these you know what would be reliable vehicles and things like that and oh my god could you imagine if there would have been a cash for clunkers like three years ago where would we where we would be now <laughs> 
we'd be totally cooked. Um, that's even like when I got my, um, when, so we, again, we've got this, this new vehicle inbound, like should the next week, it should be here after ordering in March. And I'm like, you know, if anything happens to it to try to get parts to replace it or stuff, I mean, which could be the same vehicle, like the old one we're replacing, that's becoming hard to get parts for. I mean, there's only so much too. Like I remember when they were working on it. They're like, this is about as far as we can take it. But, um, but I'm like, Oh God. So, um, Wiz Division Productions, I've been subscribed for weeks. Aaron Clary um, Lannister sends his regards. Hey, thank you. So, yes, my good friend Aaron Clary, Wiz Division, thanks for coming over here. Thanks for subscribing. I appreciate it. Greatly appreciate it. So, yes, my good friend Aaron Clary, we are both are we both are from Wisconsin, um, and yeah, Aaron has been a good friend for a number of years. Uh, periodically, we get to. Uh, meet up when he gets uh, back in the state. Um, so that's always a, a good time. And when I, so here's a story. When I first got to know Aaron. So um, I discovered Aaron actually on YouTube, right? So maybe uh, seven, eight years ago. And then I found his blog and stuff like that. And back then, um, before he was as famous as he is now, and the guys work for everything that he's he's got. I mean, he's he is a hard worker. Um, holy smokes, the number of blog posts and books and just everything he's done. He's a really hard hard worker. Um, and I and back then, um, he had an offer where if you sent him twenty dollars he would send you a thumb drive with all of his podcast. <laughs> so, and I've got this, I've got the thumb drive somewhere. So here's what it was. So again, this is like seven, eight years ago. So I sent him and, you know, it was whatever Dropbox address back when he lived in Minneapolis. Right. Um, but I sent this $20 and then um, a couple of weeks later, I get this regular envelope in the mail. And it's all ripped up. And inside is this orange thumb drive, which is just kind of bent and mangled. And I'm like, whoa. He's, okay, so this is a thumb drive from Aaron. I'm like, you you can't just send that in a, <laughs> an envelope. And I think it was just like 25, whatever the price of a stamp was back then. And, and of course, it gets caught in the machine because the machine's not meant to have this little fat thumb drive in there. So then uh, I was able to get it and everything was there. All of the, all of his shows, I think, except like the first, what he said, 30 or 40 that he's ever done. Like he doesn't know where those are, but like I said, I'd, at that time, maybe 200 shows and now he's got like what thousands, but, um, but yeah, I was, I was thrilled. I was, it downloaded those and I listened to them and, and, um, but I got a hold of them. I'm like, dude, like <laughs> that thing, that thing almost didn't make it to me. Like it, it was just barely still in the envelope and it was all bent up and I'm like, you got to like wrap it in something and have a little different way. But uh, he doesn't do that anymore. I think you just have to, there's just too much. Like you just have to go in and get his stuff. But I still have one of those legacy drives, but yeah. Um, but no, he's, he's, he's a very authentic guy and extremely hardworking. So if you don't know Aaron Clary and the Clary podcast and Captain Capitalism, um, his books, Behind the Housing Crash, um, Enjoy the Decline, and then Reconnaissance Man, which is one of my favorite books. Um, so I did a review for Reconnaissance Man. And I think it goes under the radar, right? Like um, he, because he was writing about how when he was young, he would drive all over the country well, he still does that, right? But I mean, he did it with a purpose when he was 18, 19, 20. And it was the purpose to see like, what is all out there and where might I want to live? Because I like to hike, you know, and I like warm weather and I like whatever. And so that's where he was saying, like, he figured out where he wanted to to live, right? So he lives, you know, in a warm climate and went out. He doesn't have any place still up in this northern part but um but it was really like wherever you go to college 
there's a high probability you're going to look around that area for a job too. So if you are in a cold weather climate and you go to college there and you're like, oh, I'd rather be in a warm weather climate, it's not likely you're going to make that jump. So anyway, reconnaissance man by Aaron Clary. Um, 1877 cars for kids. So robots from servants to companions to supreme overlords. Is it going to be yeah, Wall E, the movie, or is it going to be iRobot, or what's going to happen? What did I miss? It's one. So, yeah, the new vehicle we have um, runs zero weight oil. So, it's the first time I've ever dealt with a zero weight oil engine, but hopefully it'll be all right. Got to go in a minute. Enjoy the rest of the stream. Thanks, Sast. Um, Sast, cheers. Um, I just found out my work truck with all my. Oh, God, no, one. One, I just found out my work truck with all my tools was stolen 10K down the drain. Holy smokes, man, that sucks. I um, I read an article a couple days ago. One, I think it was like Hertz Rental or something, was discouraging people from from renting cars in San Francisco. You know, like they get, get off the plane and to the airport and they're like, yeah, can you just, can you not rent it? Can you take public transit or take like a cab or something? Because vehicles are just getting stolen. <laughs> and the thing is like Hertz can't replace these. I mean, it would be one thing when they could get supply, right? Or it'd be a write-off and things like that. But now they're like, we can't get additional vehicles. So they actually imagine that you're like coming into the city and they're saying, hey, like we're, any other plan here? Like, you know, can you walk? But I'm sorry, man. That sucks. I had on my my first job when I moved um, moved away. I had a toolbox that I made in high school, a metal toolbox with pull out drawers and all stuff and shop clothes. Really pretty. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but it was pretty good. And I had a lot of my grandfather's tools in there, and um, he had passed away. So, and then that thing got stolen out of my trunk. So I came out one day out of my apartment. Trunk was open, windows smashed. I'm like, great. And um, so, yeah, that was, that sucked. Um, so, yeah, sorry, buddy. Um, yeah, that is, that is, that's, I feel really bad. That's bad. Hopefully, whoever stole it hasn't broke into the toolboxes. I've sealed tight. Um, I'm really looking out for it. So, I think after my stuff got stolen, I went to like all the pawn shops in that town. It was a bigger town. And then I was just saying, hey, I'm looking for like a toolbox and which I'm sure that they get hit up with that all the time after something gets stolen. I tell them it was stolen, but I didn't find it. But still, um, yeah, anyway, it sucks. Um, that's, that's, that's bad. That's something too, like um, my brother-in-law had his catalytic converter like cut off his vehicle. So <laughs> just outside for a day. I'm kind of thinking like with this vehicle that, that we are uh, getting, I'm like, God, I mean, not any vehicle can be stolen, but like, I just, I like a current one, I would feel bad if it was stolen, but I wouldn't be like really super sad about it. But yeah, the, the newer one, yeah, definitely. Or if a catalytic converter was sawed off of it or something like that. But um, I don't know. Um, there was, so, so guys, there was a, there was a, a apparently Kias and Hyundas, Hyundais are the most stolen vehicles. There was a vehicle in, is Waukesha, Wisconsin, which isn't very close to me, but still Wisconsin. And there was, there was a high school teacher, some guy, and he, he was out he, at a state par park or a county park. And he was the only one there in his car in the parking lot. I went out for a hike and he's coming back and he sees another car. He sees these kids around his car. There's an article written about this just recently, a couple of weeks ago. And um, these kids are inside of his car and they're prying back like his dash because apparently in a Kia or Hyundai, there's a way to get the vehicle started, which is easier. <laughs> so these are the ones that they target. And, and then as he came up, like they didn't leave and so eventually like the one kid got out and then the guy's like in there and he's like, look what you guys did to my car and all this stuff. But, and then like the kid said, Hey, like get out of there. I left my cell phone in. So the guy gets out of his own car and then the kid like continues to work to try to hotwire it, gets it hotwired and then they take off <laughs> and then they crash the car and then there's damage done to it, you know, and, and this guy then is trying to say, you know, this 
kid's parent should pay for it. Like they you found out who the parents were. I'm like, good luck. I mean, the kid was 13. Um, but so yeah, it's, it's like, cause so that's one of those things too. I mean, whether, uh, you know, if you're going hiking and you're going to a state park or something and you, you'd have to think, I don't know. I have to think twice about that. Um, where you would park and, and like, even if other people are around, is it going to really be a deterrent for some of these people now? Like, it's so weird. So, I mean, car theft is a big problem um, about 40 miles from us down at the state capitol. Like, it's always in the, in the news. Um, so, Bacon wrote, Cappy sent me a thumb drive via envelope snail mail. Why am I not surprised? So, <laughs> yeah, it was like 70 years ago. It was just, yeah, it was just so funny. And, uh, yeah, I got a hold of him and said, man... So, um, thanks fellas. So yeah, well, so, again, sorry about the, the vehicle, um, being stolen. So, oh man, like I've never had a vehicle stolen, but I remember when my car was broken into and just like how, and having the toolbox, there was some other stuff that was taken out of it, but I just remember how bad that felt as like, ah, oh. yeah. And I think I was still finding glass in that car for until like the day I sold it, <laughs> like I had cleaned it over and over again, but you'd still like find tempered glass. So I'm like, uh, uh, Baker, my deterrent for car theft is having a clunker looking car. That's a stick shift. Stick shift will do it. Yeah. So, and the thing is even older vehicles, right. Are being stolen. So it's just not going after new vehicles. It's going after almost kind of like any vehicle, but, the stuff I was reading, Kia and Hyundai are the two that get target the most because I guess they're the easiest to get started. But so, man, I don't know. Um, I was watching a video by Nick Johnson, who has the the channel where he drives around the country to different cities or states and does like, here's what it's like to live in South Carolina and stuff. It does a really good show. And he was, get this. One, in the video where he was driving through the, the Tenderloin, like a, the one he posted a week ago, he's driving through and somebody throws a bottle at his car. So you can hear this big donk and then um, sound like a glass bottle, right? And then he keeps driving. So like during, you know, he's saying, I think somebody just threw something at my car. And, and he never sh he never got out and showed like where it impacted. But I think he has a pretty nice vehicle because I saw a couple of the videos where then the vehicle he was interviewing people and you could see like his vehicle next to it. And I'm like, holy smokes. Like, could you imagine like, you know, coming and having just driving through and someone would throw something, put a big dent in your, your vehicle or cracks a window or something. And, you know, it's like, man, come on. So, all right. So let's do, um, let's do a recap. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Tell your friends to subscribe. Um, thumbs up. We are at 20 thumbs up for this show. So that is greatly appreciated. So thank you so much for subscribing and the thumbs up uh, button. I appreciate that. And then I believe Monday there'll be a show. I haven't picked out a topic yet. I'm kind of thinking entropy or how all systems eventually go from order to disorder. So, you know, like if you have a car, eventually it rusts, transmission, things go out. Yeah, you can maintain things. You can like try to reorder things. An ice cube like is all ordered, and eventually, as heat gets there, it gets disordered, and things like that. Shingles on a roof, order to disorder, and just our bodies, like you know, from being ordered or being younger, more fit, keep things up. But as as we age, you know, things start to to get disordered. And thinking about how entropy impacts how we see it in our daily lives, how we can buffer against it, how we see it in systems that we interact with. Um, in school, safety entropy was a big thing because people would get together and they would do all these safety drills and stuff like that. And at the start of the year, get things really fired up and ready to go. And then they wouldn't practice throughout the whole year. So then people just are like, okay, it's just fatigue. They forget about stuff and whatever. And the system entropy is like, People forget to what, what to do during drills. They forget who has discretion and all of that stuff. So 
I talk, I have I didn't use the word entropy much until the last couple of years. Now I use it quite a bit. Um, the crap, the interview I did with the crab boater, Robert Travis, he talked about entropy of the boat, right? The boat would get ice, the crab boat, it would ice up in the Bering Sea, and then you'd have to get out with sledgehammers to knock the ice off. So, um, you oh. know, that was always, and if you didn't, this entropy, right, the system would get more chaotic, it would roll further, it would dive further, eventually it would just sink. So what is what is entropy and where are dif where are like the common parts of our life or the systems we interact with where we're most likely to see entropy and then how should we deal with that like how personally can we can we counter entropy or if we see entropy um what should we what should that tell us right basically it might say that yeah system is maintained or isn't maintained you know, or maybe it's the, it's the fact of this technology just isn't being maintained anymore. Like it's moved on to something else or these processes. So we can kind of get into that, trying to pick out of, you know, it has the, yeah, have what have the priorities, you know, shifted um, from a government, from a societal perspective or so, yeah, entrop entropy is our new, nation motto says bacon we've seen a lot of entropy in the nation right so it would um we've yeah our uh, supply systems roads bridges right um I, th I think there's been there's entropy in yeah telecommunication power lines right <laughs> where you know a, a big parts of the power grid were constructed in you know the 60s and but now there haven't been updates to it so um how are these things being maintained or are they not being maintained entropy and so let, let's see um armitage wrote there was a guy who rapped a stephen hawking called mc hawking back in the day and did a song called you down with entropy it's kind of funny i'll have to look at that um so armitage um Hawking said something about entropy. I forget what it was, but there was there was some well-known quote that Hawking had about um, how you know life is just this perpetual give and take with with entropy. And um, the thing is with entropy, right? Is once you and this is what I want to get at is trying to to give examples that. You know, we'll we'll all be able to recognize and and see, and then you know, examples that you can come forward with. And um, is if you, it's like a, it's 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 like the car, right? That starts to rust. So I'm in Wisconsin, you know, where they put salt on the roads and all that. So if the car starts to rust, well, first of all, you can wax it to delay the entropy of the rusting, right, and keep the salt off the best you can. But if it starts to rust, if you get in and address it, right. Um, you know, sand it down, get rid of the rust, do primer, and if you've got to do any filler and paint, you know, I've done all that. Not that it's been done at a high quality, but that's why I usually buy like a black vehicle. It seems to be the easiest to match up. Um, but that's if you deal with it when it's when you just kind of discover it, you can you can slow that entropy process down and, and get more time out of it. So um but it's when you let things when you let things go to a certain point, entropy is is kind of like it's better just to get rid of it, <laughs> just you know destroy it. You know it's like an old it's it's like having an old shed outside or something like that that's all warped in the boards and and shingles are bad and everything and and it's like well to rebuild this would be crazy, like it would cost way more time to like rehab this. So it would be just better to like take this down. <laughs> We put up a new shed or bring in a new shed. So there is a point when entropy just kind of destroys things. So or or else like when it destroys systems, what is what does that kind of look like? Um when entropy um but yeah we have some in entropy is also happening what I think Philadelphia was the most recent city, big city to say, oh we're not stop if you run a red light or your taillights are out or headlights or whatever, we're not going to stop you as police. Well, that's an entropy in policing, right? So that's uh, degrading. And, you know, where does that go? Because that's kind of permanent, right? You're not, if you're making the entropy in 
San Francisco, right? If you steal less than a thousand dollars worth of stuff from a store, we're not going to prosecute you. So that's entropy in a legal system. So what is this societal entropy? How do we observe it? What does it kind of tell us? But um, Armitage wrote, Hawking said Earth isn't a closed system because it's powered by the sun. That's a, wow, that's a good point. Last night they kept talking about the the one, it's the first time since like the year 418, there was this three hour um, red moon, but you had to get up like at 2 a.m. to see it. So I'm like, nope, <laughs> someone will take video of it. I'm good with that. I don't need to. I don't need to hang out and, and do it. I've seen like the, the harvest moons and all of that. So, but yeah, the really, really were bringing up on the news last night of this amazing, which I, I'm not doubting it wasn't probably spectacular, but I'm like, it has to be convenient for me or I'm not participating in it. So, um, so, all right. Well, um, today we were talking about, um, we were talking about, what were we talking about? Face validity. So let me let me go back. We had our, our articles, USA Today, Wisconsin health officials say hunters should wear a mask while handling deer carcasses. So from a face validity standpoint, um, a few questions with that. One is a deer isn't breathing. There isn't aerosol produced when it's dead. So if you're handling it, what's the likelihood that you're going to have um, things aerosol or, or you know, and the other part is Wisconsin has had since 2002 or 20, 20 years, this um, chronic wasting disease in deer, Kreutzfeldt Jacob um, disease, where in mad cow, that same disease, if people would eat cow, right, in, in Great Britain, the disease was getting in their brain. So why not have the mask and all these precautions and gloves and whatever for chronic wasting disease, which they also have these testing sites all over. They have one 11 miles from me where you're supposed to bring in your deer. Um, but so why is it you don't have mask and things for that, but you have it here because a deer might have the SARS virus from a face release standpoint, I just don't get it. Again, the, the deer's not breathing when you're processing it. And wouldn't you just have standard processing protocols for a deer anyway? But the next one was from the star, the bottle, the battle against airborne COVID has shifted while your mask is a last layer of defense. And that got into the need um, because it's getting cold and why you need to wear masks to prevent uh, because there's more or less aerosols. But the article itself didn't say, here's what aerosols look like in cold weather and warm weather. Here's the you know different type of mask. So it's for investigative journalism, this was an article that just didn't have anything, <laughs> even though it was like written by someone who may have said that I'm an investigative journalist. So, so from there, I'm like, okay, that's just a headline grabber. Um, Zero Hedge had Cargill, CEO. Cargill is the food um, kind of processing company. CEO ditches the term transitory and says um, food inflation will persist. And we looked at that and said, yeah, from a face validity standpoint, this is what we're seeing. Prices of food aren't going down. And also when a CEO says this from face validity, the message is just get used to this consumers, like just expect things to go up. So it's a messaging to try to buffer um, pushback down the road of saying, hey, this is, remember people handle things better, even if it's bad news, if you tell them ahead of time. So this is really cargo from a face validity standpoint, just saying, yeah, prices are going to, are high and they're going to go higher and they're just going to stay there. NPR wrote, beware of shrinkflation, inflation's devious cousin. That's where we brought out our box here, a special K. And, and this is the old family size box, so like four months ago. And this one is bigger. It has more special K in it <laughs> than the new box, which is taller and skinnier. So, and changing portion size and all that. So are we seeing that? Yes. Like I see it in these boxes, the stuff that I'm buying. Um, so when you start to see that also, remembering for the company to change up their boxes, their machinery, how they produce these things, the graphics on it, that takes a lot of work. So that also means they don't think this is going to change in the next couple of months. Otherwise, they wouldn't deal with this. Like, it's a lot of work to do this. So, um, And then also our fifth one from UPI was that an owl flies into a school and the school happens to have a mascot that is an owl, which is just cool. So face validity, that's coolness. All right. 
Um, let's go through the, the chat. I think we're almost we're almost set here. This is uh, bacon to Armitage. All the energy the Earth has is from the sun. Our bodily functions include. So, yeah. Remember when, you, I don't know, remember when you were a kid and there used to be these stories of there will be, the sun will burn out in six billion years or like, you know, it will it will grow and, and eat up all the other planets and stuff like that. And then you'd be like, oh, no. Like if you're hearing that and you're 10 years old, I mean, it's a real downer until you kind of realize, well, <laughs> like a billion years from now, I'm not sure that's going to impact my existence all that much but uh but yeah that was that was i was i remember like yeah watching some special in school or something about this of like this how the sun's gonna go mega nova or whatever it is I'm like, well, i hope it doesn't happen next year but um yeah like it wouldn't just be probably just be a split second anyway but so all right everybody um thanks for the uh, thumbs up thanks for the subscriptions again we are at 627 subscribers so we are in sight of that 1000 uh, which is exciting. And um, I'm thinking Monday, I'm still working on that, but I'm kind of leaning toward a show on em entropy. And then we'll see what we have here for next Friday. So the day after um, Thanksgiving, we'll see what we have in the old face validity bin. But remember, face validity, and I think a great way to explain it to people who aren't as familiar with the term as, as all of you are, is to say, um, hey, if you if you're standing out in a snowstorm and you have a thermometer and you're looking at it and the thermometer says 88 degrees, you know that the face validity, what this is trying to measure, temperature, that's wrong. Face validity, you know it can't be 88 degrees because you're shivering and it's snowing. Um, so either the thermometer is broken, the measurement tool is broken, the information device is broken. Or like you're delusional, right? Your senses are not accurate. So that's why you also need a member check network. You need people around you to say, whoa, Dave, like you're you're hallucinating right now. <laughs> so this is all wrong. Um, so people to, you know, because sometimes you get brought up into all these anxiety and this emotion, stuff like that. Um, so it's, and we have a really good sense as humans to detect face validity. And we just tend to not do it. Um, but again, if you start using this, you start using those terms, start talking about it. Good. So face validity Friday post Turkey day were all my leftovers. So yeah, cool. And then Carl, Carl, thank you for being here. Yes, we are going to shut the show down, but thanks. And also down, down below, one of the things, please post in the comments, um, anything you see that is a, should be a face validity article or like any entropy signs like that you see in your area, like, or anything you want from today's show. But I do read those. And then I would love to pull those forward because especially if you're like, hey, this would be great for a face validity Friday next week, like post it down in the comments and I will gladly pull that forward. So, all right, everybody um, have a, whoa, all right. When what your senses do not match your measurement, ask questions. So that's that's in a nutshell, that's what face validity is. So um yeah, and I have a I have a whole chapter about that in um in the velocity of information, which I'm excited about. So I have I also have a <laughs> I have an image that Juan Brown sent me um where he was at in near the Oroville Dam as the spillway was being um poured with the new concrete. And he's like, hey, maybe you could use this in your book. I'm like, yeah, maybe. I don't see. The thing is, like, the book is already going into print. They're, they're setting it. So, and I can check my messages after this. I emailed one of the editors last night, and I said, I've, I've just got this image, and I think this would work. Um, but I know you're, you're typesetting stuff, and it's, it's a pain to do this when you're typesetting. But I think it's really worth, like, putting it in. So I made a pretty strong argument. If not... I'll still use the image when I present and stuff, but they really hate it. <laughs> when they're working on a book and type saying it, they really hate it if you come back and say, oh, I want to change this. But I think there's a really compelling reason to bring this picture in. Um, so we'll see. The worst they can say is no, and the chapter is still fine without it. So Carl's got it, though. When what your senses do not match, match your measurement, ask questions. I, that should be like on a mug, right? If I ever did merch, 
that should be on a mug or a, a t-shirt right and we'd have to have some kind of logo so somebody here who is an artist so i don't have to end up um <laughs> yeah so i don't i don't have to deal with intellectual property stuff someone who wants to to draw that or i can buy like an image off of um i think that would be i think that'd be pretty cool yeah when what your senses do not do not match your measurement ask questions like that's that's coffee that's coffee mug that's like on the top of a notepad that's like on every safety um actually carl like every every safety document that comes out you know um should have that printed on it <laughs> like just up in up on the top or in the corner or whatever and just as a to remind people because right in the moment you're especially um when things start to start to go sideways and things like that the information you're getting is is, is not going to pattern um clearly and you're going to be like whoa like something here isn't isn't up so then yeah figure out ask the questions i love that that's really good so anybody wants to design anything send it to me carl you're good a lot of people have said carl's a great artist i'm like yeah i know i hear that too so um once we get up to a thousand subs 677 so carl h what do you do man all right, well, guys, I need to uh, shut this down. It has been a great one. So I am going to first um, do this. Dun, dun, dun. Face Validity Fridays, our second episode is in the book here. Hey, this is the Safety Doc podcast with your good friend. Well, Safety Doc, I've kind of dropped the podcast. This is the Safety Doc with your good friend, Dr. David Proden from down here in the North Star Recording Studio in um, the state of Wisconsin. And again, this was Face Validity Fridays where we are saying, hey, if you're if what your senses are telling you do not match the measurement, ask questions. And we had a couple interesting uh, stories that we went through today. So, and I will see you back here next week this time. And then Monday night, I don't have it up yet, but I'm working on Monday night show of the Safety Doc Podcast. I do have a really nice blog post out on safetyphd.com. Everything for like, you know, all of my work is over there safetyphd.com plus a link to school of air is the most honest book about the school safety industry if you haven't left a review for this all pro lemonton dun, 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 armitage dun, 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 please get a review out for it that's been out uh since 2019 and excited getting down on that timeline of it won't be long um before people can start to pre-order the velocity of information so i should be hearing about that in the next few weeks that have that link out there so I want everybody to have a great day. That da -dun, da -dun, is a wrap here, my friends. I'm going to go, wow. All right. I am out of here. Have yourselves a great Friday. All right, everybody. Take care.